I grew up in Southern California. My dad is a gardener for over, over 45 years in, in the San Gabriel Valley, which is west of here. And so this is where, where my life has come. I, I grew up in a blue-collar family. Me and my brothers are first to go to university or college and then played football by God's grace and ended up coaching. And then now God has, us, God has me pastoring at a church called Evergreen SGV in La Puente. And that's what we're doing. But um, anyway, let's just pray. I want to make sure we had a chance to pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Pray with me, brothers. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity to speak to your men. What a privilege. What else would I rather be doing right now than to speak to your men? So God, I ask that it is you who speak through your word by the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. I'll allow your spirit to minister your truth so that we will love your son Jesus Christ more. And as you say in your word, 1 Corinthians uh, 16, be on the Lord, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Allow this to be a reality as Pastor Rosales exhorted and encouraged us to act like men, to be protectors, be on the alert, to be strong and courageous. Allow us to lead with a quality that screams of your son, Jesus Christ. So thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, brothers, thank you. And we're, what we're talking, I'm going to put this down here. What we're talking about here is being men of God here today. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about how this happened. How does leadership birth? It starts with truth. The more you know truth, the more conviction you have. The more conviction that you have shapes the quality of your leadership. And how is leadership birth is this. The more decisions that you make, that affect people for good or for bad, forges and grows that leadership within you. So as we're talking about fierce leadership, we need to be practicing this constantly. And, um, and I, one of the enemies to coaching is this. So every Sunday or every Saturday when I was in college, what the biggest, one of the biggest things is this. Whether we win or lose, we hope we won, but the key idea is can we play as good as we can? That's it. And if the other team is better, God bless them, you know. But as long as we played as good as we can, that's what we wanted to do. But distractions was the biggest thing. Distractions from what the 90,000 people in the stands are thinking. Distractions of maybe trying to play in the NFL someday. Distractions of, like, worrying about what other people think. We try to eliminate that. Distractions of what the media would write about you or say about you. Forget all that we used to tell them. Let's focus on us. And so right now, you may come here distracted. That's why Pastor Dave and the leadership wanted to corral the men together. Kind of unique. This is special. Friday, Saturday, and then you have the Lord's Day tomorrow. But just to say, hey, let's clear the deck here. Maybe you come here distracted with issues at work. Maybe you, just, you had a fight with your wife on coming here. That happens to me too sometimes, and I gotta preach after. So I gotta. There's a lot of repenting that takes place. In the <laughs> <laughs> happens. I'm still under. We are all under the sanctification process. Amen. Since my wife's out of town, that didn't happen this time. So I feel pretty good right here. <laughs> you know, and maybe you come with burden with health concerns. These are real issues. These are real life issues, and I want to take you to the scriptures here. You didn't come here to hear, just hear me tell some stories. I want to take you to the scriptures. We're going to be at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 is basically the high point of scripture. You're going to see a picture of God here. All right, if you got your Bibles, you got your phones, Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah's mind was distracted. Isaiah is a prophet of God, man of God, called to preach God's word. And Isaiah comes in with the king of Israel dead, King Uzziah. King Uzziah started reigning as king at age 16. He reigned for 52 years. It's a long time. And, and, and the Israelites enjoyed an unusual time of prosperity. This was a good king. He did a good job overall. And this is transition time. So, and he's dead now. And as Isaiah looks around, there aren't many good re replacements. His sons, I was like, I don't know. 
What is going to happen to our nation? And on top of that, enemies are marching in to take over. Real enemies. Foreign enemies. So the idea comes, of what are we going to do? And perhaps right now, I mean, you're thinking about presidential things of our nation. America is the greatest nation on the planet. It's a blessing to live here. And then perhaps you're thinking, okay, how, who's going to be the next leader who's going to bring our economy back to where it should be? Our national prom prominence, our health care. Who's going to take care of the health care? Who's going to return our nation to a Judeo-Christian culture, country again? And you may be thinking that. Isaiah was thinking those things as, he, as he's thrust into heaven right now, right? as he has his vision. So perspective, Isaiah is going to get perspective from God. So we, we're going to be at Isaiah chapter 6. In, at my church, we have a custom to rise. Is that okay we rise so we honor God's word? I'm not sure if you guys do that, but this is just an attempt to show the Lord how much, if you're able to please rise. Isaiah chapter 6. God's word says this. I'll be reading out the NASB version. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim, these are angelic beings, stood above him, each having six wings. One, two, three, four, five, six. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold tremble at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then, the Bible says, I said, woe is me, Isaiah's words, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. Verse 7, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Please have a seat. Isaiah was filled with all these concerns, perhaps concerns that you have in your mind right now. Right now, Isaiah was thrust into the throne room of heaven. He has a vision of heaven. The deck is cleared now. You literally were able to see a glimpse of heaven through the word right there, Isaiah chapter 6. There was a massive shift happening. Forget everything the Lord is saying to him. As he says, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord, the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 6. Adonai, this is the word. This is talking about God's sovereignty. This is the God who rules over everything. The Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He's the master ruler of everything. As Uzziah is not on the throne, it's very clear that God has been sitting on the throne for eternity. There is no transition at that level. There may be man transition. My pastor, uh, our pastor has been there for 42 years. He transitioned. He retired. People are probably wondering, what's going on with this new guy? It's never been about the pastor. It's never been about a president. It's never been about a king. It's about the king who's sitting on the throne. Isaiah is going, boom, his head is exploding right now. It's like and all these other things. Assyria, all these all the problems of the world didn't matter. And these are real problems. And he sees God's glory. And to give us a picture of this, the Bible says there are these seraphim. These are these, I mean, if one of these seraphim were to appear, all of us would be shaking in our boots. These are incredible angelic beings. Six wings, right? Powerful, scary. Other parts of the Bible say so they had various faces. With two, he covered, they covered their face to show their humility before God. I am not worthy to look upon God. With two, they covered their feet saying, I'm not moving unless you command me to move. And two, they hovered and they flew and worshipped God. And the worship was so intense that they called out, 
to one another. Revelation 4, he says, this nonstop worship is happening in heaven right now. Right now, God, our Lord, is being worshipped nonstop. I mean, the worship here this morning was pretty good. Right? I think it all lift, it lifted my heart being up to be able to ask me, would you like to be in the back or here? No, I want to be singing with a man. That lifts my heart. That was just a small sample of what it must be like in the heavenly throne room right now. Amen? And they're singing, holy, 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 kadosh in the Hebrew. All right? This means God is distinct, separate, without sin, perfect, perfect, separated from all creation. This is the only time in the scriptures where God is described as Holy, holy, holy. Three times God's characteristic is described. Holy, holy, holy. This is for emphasis, brothers. This is marking who God is. He is the Holy One. R.C. Sproul, he's a theologian, talks about this in the sense he goes, he, God's never described as love, love, love. Although God is love. He's never described as that. He's never described as merciful, merciful, merciful. Although God is merciful. Powerful, 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 although God is powerful. He's completely holy. I like how this, it helps me. I'm a new pastor, so I rely on good sources. Guys are smarter than me. R.L. Dabney talks about holiness, therefore, is to be regarded not as a distinct attribute, not a separate attribute, but as the result, result of all of God's moral attributes together. Holy, holy, holy. This is who our God is. His holiness is the collective and consummate glory of His nature. This is who our God is. He's holy. I'm going back to the worship here now. These angelic beings are worshiping the, the God on the throne. They're singing. And people ask me, Rocky, what do you miss about coaching? Do you miss the games? Do you miss like... Uh, the practices, and I do to some levels. The biggest thing I miss is the relationships. That's why this is big for me to be here. Even if I met some of you, I know we're connected in brotherhood in Christ. But I also miss certain things, you know, and, and the intensity of the moment. You know, as pastors, we have that too, but it's different in a different way. This is where we get to share what an experience together at, at, on the Lord's Day and right now. But the, in the game, there's there's some key moments that would happen in the game, and uh, I hope this is okay. So I'm gonna um, ask Mason to run a video to kind of show you one of the moments that came to mind as I was studying this text in Isaiah six, what I lived through. So if you could run that, we got a short minute and a half clip to you guys to watch and, and to enjoy here. Crowd silent now, as opposed to when the Saints have the ball. Oh, look at this run! What a run! Marshawn Lynch still oh. on his feet. Has blockers now. He's dancing his way for the touchdown. Uh. That's as good an effort as I've ever seen in my life from a running back who they traded for from Buffalo. Downhill, physical, and down the field, you're gonna see Matt Hasselbeck and the whole offensive line. Watch him cut it back, and you're gonna see all kinds of people sprinting down the field to help him. He breaks the tackle of Shanley, runs through Sharper, runs through Adele, runs through Jabari Greer. Get off me, he says to Tracy Porter. Look all the way down the field, Hasselback. All the offensive linemen. Are you kidding me? Columbus is down the field. 78, Columbus, the offensive guard. The quarterback, Hasselback, was 30 yards down the field. Look at the hustle by Columbus. Here he is right here. Hasselback, Michael Williams. Locklear, look at that. Locklear and Hasselbeck coming up from behind. Are you? And uh, that was from 2010. That was my first year in the league. And uh, I was coming from college. And we were 7-9 and nine that season. 
And so, by God's grace, we want we made the playoffs. That was a, a playoff game, but that was in the fourth quarter. We basically helped seal the game, and we beat the defending world champions. But what I, my point is this: as I was list, watching this, the Bible says the threshold, the foundation of the temple was shaking because the worship was so intense. This thing is, although it's an impressive feat by a created being, Marshawn's a terrific athlete and running back. There's a lot of things that we kind of stirs our heart as we watch that. But the people were so jacked. The people were so moved with emotion at Central League Stadium that day that they actually had seismic activity taking place during that moment. I mean, that's worship. Like, ah, like 70,000 people. And so Seattle in that area, just a little bit of trembling taking place. As I think to myself, yes, I'm moved to that, but how much more will we be in the presence of God will be worshiping with greater intensity? This is a created person. Oh, as talented as he may be, we're moved when LeBron makes a slam dunk or something like that, right? I get that. That's cool. But what is it going to be like when we see God? And these seraphim are worshiping like crazy, right? It says literally the foundations of the threshold of the temple was trembling at the voices that say, holy, holy, holy. And the smoke started filling up the temple. Intense worship. And then what happens here? Verse 5. The Bible, my version says, NASB says, then. There's a big transition there, then. See, the focus has always been about God. This whole scene has been about God. <laughs> it's like, okay. And then God directs Isaiah to write about what's going on in Isaiah's heart. Now then, scene change. Isaiah's perspective now. This is our perspective now. Put yourself in Isaiah's feet. Keep in mind, as, you, as we read Isaiah 5 together, Isaiah is a man of God. Isaiah is holy person this is a legit guy not perfect he's a prophet of god and i know i've done some ridiculous things before coming to christ and even earlier on and this is isaiah's reaction think about this as yourself he says then big transition shift woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I, am, I live among a people of unclean lips. I am damned, he's saying. I'm going to burn up in the presence of God. I am a sinner. I have no legitimate place with the Lord. Bad news. He realizes who he is. Why? For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He experienced the Lord right there. And all the good works, all the reputation from the people, all the credentials, all his resume had to offer, <laughs> none of that mattered. None of that mattered. He was totally, totally aware of God's holiness. And it just boom, put everything in perspective. If you, my brother, are sitting in here thinking, yeah, you know, I'm more advanced than the guy sitting next to me. <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the grading curb, okay? That ain't the grading curb. <laughs> that's not the curb that God judges on. He, got, he judges on, on his own standard, Amen. And so Isaiah is like going, oh, my goodness. I think back in 2010, I'm going to share some of my own struggles. I was just filled with arrogance and pride. Uh, um, like I talked about, um, I, I was a, uh, grew up in a blue-collar family. And my dream was to, a lot of our customers, my dad's customers, clients, uh, like we did Pasadena and that area, his route. And a lot of the customers were Trojans, you know, and, 
in my mind, and my dad used to go to games. He, he didn't go to college, but he went to games. He used to tell me stories about games at the Coliseum. And I thought to myself, you know, fathers, you know, we just want lot, pleasing our fathers is a big deal. If you're a father, giving affirmation to your sons and daughters is a powerful deal. Proverbs 17, 6 says, glory to children is a father. It's a big deal. So in my heart, even though I wasn't a Christian, I wanted to please my dad. There's no one I saw that worked harder. He wasn't perfect, but he's exactly what I needed. And so part of my way of honoring him and kind of like getting his affirmation, man, if I ever could play football at the University of Southern California, I'd be somebody. I wasn't a Christian, but I wanted to be somebody. I mean, look at me. <laughs> you don't have to be a prophet to say, man, you don't look like God's gift of football, okay? I'm, not nor <laughs> I'm a normal guy. I'm norm a very normal guy in terms of ability, right? But somehow, by God's grace, able to go to Mount Sac, transfer to USC, walk on, get a scholarship, and then end up coaching there for 11 years. Well, keep that in mind now. During that time, God gets a hold of me. I had a teammate named Rocky Brown who preached Christ to me in the locker room. Boom, I became a believer. But during those 13 years at USC, I knew I was in Christ. I knew I was a new creation. I knew I was a saint in Christ. I knew my identity was in Christ. But there was that tension. Most of my pats in the back came from, oh, you got a scholarship. That's incredible. Wow, you guys won the national championship twice, back to back. That's incredible. Wow, you're the guy who walked on. Now you're the you're a full time coach. You're the guy that walked on, but now you're the defensive coordinator at USC. There's some tension there. Is my identity in Christ, or is it USC? There's a lot of that going on. Sin. There's a there's a there's a, there's a battle going on in my heart. So go back to 2010. My first year, you know, bef uh, the preseason before uh, this clip that I showed you, I was filled with pride. I was filled with like, because what happened was, I love Coach Carroll. He and I are tight. Love him dearly. But I was mad at him because at USC, when he, uh, when he went to the Seahawks, I wasn't originally planned to come with him. I was like, what? You know how many jobs I turned down to stay here? And this is all just arrogant. Just thinking me, 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 me. Anyway, he eventually asked me later on, a month later, and said, hey, could you come be the quality control coach? Quality control coach is a great position, but it's the entry-level coaching position in NFL. I used to be the defensive coordinator. You know what I mean? You think, Wait, that's stuff I used to do 10 years ago. I don't know if you guys are, any of you guys are in that work situation right now. That God was humbling me. I was mad. It's like, that's like, uh, like maybe Isaiah, maybe not quite the same, but I was distracted. I was distracted. So I'm, I'm, I'm going for a jog, as I normally do on the game day. We're in Oakland, California, or Northern California, getting ready to play the Oakland Raiders. My first preseason or final preseason game of my first season in the NFL, and I go jogging, listen to a sermon or something, and then I'm running around. And it, we're, we're in an area called Redwood City, and then I went running, and all of a sudden I see, hear this, <clears throat> this noise caught my attention. I looked up. And about 60 yards in front of me, I see a plane crash right before my eyes. What? I was like, oh. and that, during that time, I was having a pity party in my heart. And in that moment, the Lord grabbed a hold of my heart and said, what are you so worried about? If you're on that plane, Rocky, you think you're going to be worried about this stuff? If you guys were on that plane, would you be worried about anything, what you're worried about right now? It, was a, just, it wasn't like a jet airliner. It was like a three-man plane, propeller plane, and it was the pilot, uh, his girlfriend, I guess, and then a really wealthy, wealthy steel man who helped build up the city of San Jose. In that moment, I thought to myself, I'm drawn to Isaiah 6 now. When you see your maker, what you're thinking about right now, what may be capturing your heart to distract you from the Lord, to obey him, will it even matter? You won't be thinking about who the president of the United States is. You won't be thinking about your financial issues. You won't be thinking about your job or how you didn't get the promotion or how you, 
or how you did get the promotion. You won't be t too worried about your retirement fund. You won't be worried about your reputation or what people think about you on social media. It's not going to matter. Your wife and your children, you just be praying and hoping that they trusted Christ. So right there, Isaiah is thinking nothing matters. Uzziah doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if these nations come and destroy our kingdom. I'm a sinner. I'm damned. I'm going to burn up. I deserve to go to hell, be separated from God forever. It, there's no discussion at that point. It's like, oh, I get it. Sometimes we like to discuss, why is this not fair, God? Well, I don't think these things are going to be coming up in that moment. I fully get it now. And so, verse 6, there's another transition. The Bible is so good. People like me could just understand what it says. Verse 6 starts off with then, another transition, gear shift. Gear shift. What I read to you was bad news. Woe is me. That's bad news. That is bad news. But then, now here's good news. Here's the gospel in the Old Testament foreshadowing the gospel. Then one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. Okay, verse 7. He touched my mouth. With it, he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity, your guilt, is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Your sin is atoned for. Fire in the Old Testament symbolizes God's holiness. This is a fiery coal, burning coal. This is pays. This, is an, this represents atonement, payment, satisfaction for our sins. God is satisfied through this burning coal. The cornerstone. And we have the forgiveness of our sins, the Bible says right there to Isaiah. Cleansing us, making us pure, righteous, holy like our God. I make all things new, the Bible says. Reconciling us to God. No longer is Isaiah saying, I'm your enemy. I'm a rebel. Now God is saying, you're my friend. So we're talking about fierce obedience. And I, I think I have some ability to kind of exhort and get you guys fired up to some level. But... Just like in football, you can give a good pregame pep talk in the locker room, but as soon as you get hit in the mouth, you forget about all that stuff, you know? <laughs> as soon as your wife or, or certain obstacles show up in your life, you can be like, I don't know what they talked about. It's like, right? I don't want to leave you with that. I want to give you some of that. Trust me, I, that's naturally part of who I am. But I want to give you word. I want to give you truth so you can let this sit into your bones so there's some, a conviction starts burning into your heart. So you leave your change this weekend. Verse 8. Then, another transition. Gear shift. The shift here now. God gives some employment here. Then, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Trinitarian language. Who will go for us? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then there's another then. Here's Isaiah's response. Then I say, here am I, send me. <laughs> Whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you want, Lord. There was no negotiations. There was no like, well, what about, can I do this instead? There was no... It's going to be too expensive for me, Lord. There's no negotiation. How could you even begin to talk at that level, right? You're like, all right, Lord, I'm bad news. Now I'm good news. Now I'm your friend. Whatever you want. You own me. I gave myself fully to you. Whatever you want. God said, it's going to be hard. They're, not, they're going to have hard. They're not going to listen. Here am I. Send me. Later on in this chapter, you're going to face opposition, Isaiah. Here am I. Send me. No one's going to listen to you. Not many people are going to listen to you. Here am I. Send me. And 
if this serves as any encouragement to you, I mean, these are those thoughts that come to my mind. You know, I mean, in the NFL, they do pay you better than pastoring. I got, they do. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't know if you knew that, but I got four little kids, 14, 12. I got two daughters, two sons. I got a wife, you know. I like, we all like to take care of our people, you know. And so those are the thoughts that come to my mind as, that, as you're like, Lord, are you really calling us to do this? This desire started burning in my heart, but then those thoughts are like, well, but I've got to take care of my wife, my kids. I, I have this, par- you know, I've been used to operating under a certain way, you know, and then how's this, financially that is, how's this going to work, right? The more I looked into the face of Christ, <laughs> these issues didn't seem as big anymore. And I'm not saying these things don't like, you know, like work in our hearts still. I mean, the positive is that we're praying more for things and we're more thankful for things when things do come through. Amen? Amen. So God uses us stuff to sanctify us, to trust in him, not in things. So as I look to the face of Christ, that encouraged us, you know, to, yes, this is what we're supposed to do. Here am, Here are we, I guess we're a family, send us. What a privilege. So I asked, I asked this question earlier. We'll land here in a few moments. I want to make sure I stay in my time. What do you need to move on? Brothers, brotherhood here, sitting in here right now. What do you need to move on? What is it? It could be giving up some addiction. It could be giving up some kind of a bad relationship. Maybe you need to change work. I don't know, maybe someone you guys are called to ministry full-time. Doesn't mean you can't be in ministry as a lay person, but maybe it's a unique thing. This is a very unique thing that we've been called to do as pastors, you know. So, again, it's not for everybody. It's not varsity, junior varsity. It's just what kind of ministry, perhaps. What is he calling you to do? Obey. As Christians, there is no choice. There's really no choice. This is what we do. It's a way of life. I just want to remind you, put yourself in Isaiah's shoes right there. You will obey. And in, in that moment, all these things won't matter. I just have to give you some perspective. You know, I, I live in San Gabriel Valley. You guys have these beautiful mountains. you got the Chino Valley here. We live in the San Gabriel Valley. I took my kids, my four kids and my wife up to a place called Henninger Flats. You know, we, we hiked up this mountain, and you get to see the valley, you get good perspective of the San Gabriel Valley. And that's what I'm trying to do to you right now. I'm trying to elevate your perspective of Christ. The higher view you have of Christ, all these other things will be put in its place. Let me just leave you with this. John 12, if you want to write this down, if you're a note taker, John 12, 41. Bible is so good because the Bible helps interpret itself so many times. All right, so John 12, I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to wait for those pages to t- stop turning because I want you to be there. I want you to read this for yourself. I, 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 there's something happens when you see it with your own eyes. I believe that conviction, that truth. So it's not just Rocky told you this. It's like this is God telling you this. John 12, 41. By the way, as you're turning there, I, I, I feel so privileged that you guys were asking me to be here because I do have a high affinity and, and love and respect for Calvary Chapel churches because there's a commitment to high commitment to God's word and to Christ. Right? I mean, so thank you for trusting me. Right? I get it. This is right, you can't just let any old guy just show up and just start talking, right? So I want to make sure I'm faithful to this. This is the conviction. I share that conviction. That's why the brotherhood is even tighter here. John 12, 41. Let's read this. These things Isaiah said, John is giving us who it was. He's sitting on the throne. He saw his glory and he spoke of him. Who's him and his? This is talking about Jesus Christ. Isaiah saw Christ on the throne. Make no unclear terms about it. This is Christ, the one we're serving. He is the one that we're going to be looking to. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, sitting on the throne right now. He is also the one that came off the throne and paid the price. The Bible says this. He who was rich became poor so that you and I could become rich. 
The one seated on the throne left the throne, put on human skin, was treated like a slave, was murdered on the cross, was buried in the grave, three days later resurrected from the grave, and he's back on the throne. Love him for that. Love him for who he is. Who you love, what you love is what you will serve. Elevate your love, your view for Christ. This is what this is about, brothers. It's about Christ in no unclear terms. You love Christ, you will obey. And if you're struggling with obedience, there's grace. But look to Christ. Fix your gaze on Christ. And things will seem perfectly clear like it did for Isaiah. You will say, here am I, send me.